everyone. This is the second part of section 5.1, Motivation and Orthogonality of Stern Liouville uh, Problems, uh, chapter 5, first section. So in the first part, we uh, considered the initial boundary value problem of heat equation, which uh, give us some more general type of eigenvalue problem, which is a special case of a strong level uh, problems. And also I mentioned that in order to understand strong level theory, you have to know, you have to understand the concept of orthogonality. So we reviewed the orthogonality concept in dot product in R3 or C3. Okay. Now we can extend that concept to more uh, general vector space, like <coughs> vector space of piecewise continuous function or continuous function. Uh, so certain type of functions defined on AB, real value or complex value, where the inner product can be defined using integral. Integral f, so inner product with respect to the weight function r of x, where r of x is positive function on AB, that is defined using definite integral f of x g of x times r of x dx. Uh, if we consider complex value, then this has to be uh, complex conjugate. Oops, let me take it. All right, it's just like this case, right? In complex uh, C3 case, right? Complex value vector. If it is everything in real number, we don't need that. Then we find that obviously if weight function and constant function one, that would be just you know definite integral of f and g. This one is obvious true when you have f here, f plus g and h, f plus g times h, f g and uh, f plus g and h, then f h g h, and you just distribute because integral, definite integral is linear, you can split over addition, you have that property. And constant multiple can be taken out of it, so you have this property. And this one by definition will be square, so it is greater than or equal to zero. And this being equal to zero means because this is the whole thing, because it is positive, positive. A part non-negative function being zero means everything must be zero because it is continuous function everywhere. Well, continuous function, we can confirm this is a continuous function. That will be easier. In fact, in order to have a complete theory, we have to so-called you know, measurable function, plus Ludeg integral, and then instead of continuous, just, you know, integral function, actually square integral function. But we want to be a little bit casual, casual here. So let's consider just continuous, right? piecewise continuous. And then this is equal zero means the whole thing here is zero everywhere. Because it's positive always, this has to be zero. So you get this. This is precisely the property uh, of the dot product we learned, right? That's exactly the same property of the dot product. Okay. Actually, this is four. And Three was this f g is equal to g f, right? Now, if it is complex conjugate, it has to be complex conjugate. All right. These are all the same properties of the dot product in R three or C three. In fact, these four properties are the Axioms we need to define inner product space. 
Okay? Abstract vector space where vector space where inner product define uh, which the inner product which satisfies these four conditions. We call it inner product. Okay? So we can have an inner product, we can define inner product in vector space of continuous function. Alright? Now, so you can think of this inner product as just like a dot product of vectors, right? It's no longer three-dimensional vector. Your function space is infinite dimensional, actually. But still, we can visualize this inner product as just like a dot product of two vectors in R3. We can visualize it, all right, intuitively. Then the norm. Uh, first of all, two functions are called orthogonal. Well, just like dot product equals zero means perpendicular. We, now our inner product here is just like a dot product in R3. So they are called orthogonal with respect to R of X. If inner product using weight function R equals zero. Okay? Then the norm of F is basically magnitude of vector. Now, our function is a vector here. So, norm of f with respect to the, again, weight function r of x will be just, look at this, if you put f m f, okay? We define this one, square root of this. Therefore, norm square is this. So this is the size of a vector f, or size of function f. Now, the set of functions f1 through, you know, it could be infinitely many, called ortho orthogonal set. If two different functions are orthogonal, different functions are orthogonal, non-zero function, orthogonal. Now, if these set of functions are not only orthogonal, but also size 1, what does it mean? We learned that delta ij means it is zero if ij are different, different functions are orthogonal. If ij are equal, then this is one, the size one, right? Orthonormal. Orthonormal means size one. Okay. <clears throat> now. Generalized Fourier series. So, how we use this new introduced concept? Generalized Fourier series. Fourier series. Now, let's say curly A. This is a set of certain functions, some functions on this interval. Okay. For example, it could be set of all piecewise continuous functions, or set of all continuous functions, set of all differential functions, continuously differential functions, or infinitely differential functions, or it could be the set of all analytic functions. So, set of certain type of functions. Now, suppose that the curly F is the set of some functions. Countably made is orthogonal. Orthogonal subset of this one. Okay? Then, question. The first question we want to uh, ask or answer is. If this one generates the entire function space or not, which means, i.e., for all function in this thing, there exists some coefficients, r or c, depending on the setting, such that every function can be described as 
sum of the infinite series of this function. So if this is analytic function, analytic function is any function which can be described as sum of the power series, right? Then this one will be, <coughs> if it is power series around the origin, these are 1, x, x squared to the third. Then analytic functions are always uh, can be written as summation of these power functions, non-negative zero, uh, non-negative integer power functions, right? But then they are not necessarily orthogonal. Okay. Well, at least generate part. Now we want this to be orthogonal, not only just generating but orthogonal. But generating part means this, alright? Now the question is, if this is possible, how do we get A? How to find AIs, these coefficients, right? Well, when you dealt with uh, analytic functions, yes, these power functions were not orthogonal, so this one has to have Full, uh, what is it? Taylor's series formula, right? n order at 0, n factorial actually n, right? This is our, you know, functions. But the problem is this is not orthogonal with respect to a constant function 1, okay? That's the drawback. So, however, if they are all orthogonal, the basis, so-called basis functions are orthogonal, we can get this one quite easily, unlike Taylor series. Okay? And we can answer this one. Let's say from 4, from 4, let's consider this. Inner product of f and x of k. k. Alright? The inner product, a lot of times we just drop this r. The weight function will be known from the context, right? Either constant one or whatever the weight function is. So this inner product, one through infinity, f of i, f of k, right? Now, this one is obviously by definition from a to b, f of xi, x times f of k of x, r of x, dx. Well, if you were finite sum, you can distribute you know, this definite zero. But when you have an infinite sum, we need some more conditions on these functions. But if your functions are nice enough, we can split. <coughs> This one. So this is, uh, we are using this one a finite number of times, then you can get, always do this. When you have a finite sum, you can do it this, right? Our assumption is that this can be done even for infinite sum, all right? AIFI. AIFR. AIFI. So you will get a i f i f k. Now we know that because this is orthogonal, this is zero for all i other than k. Everything will be zero except when your index i hits exactly the same as k. A k f k f k. Therefore. Your a k must be f f k over f k. See, this is nothing but f k long square, right? When you look inner product of the same thing. So, what do you get? When we introduce inner product using Definite integral, 
against a weak function R of x. The infinite series out of this <coughs> these orthogonal bases can be obtained, and that coefficient will be very easy to get. Unlike Taylor's formula in Taylor's series, right? There, uh, power functions were not orthogonal. So, theorem A. If this set of functions is a set of <coughs> orthogonal functions on a B with respect WRT is with respect to with respect to R of X usually is assumed from the context and if F can be written as four okay as a sum of infinite series Then your f of x on to infinity f inner product f n of x over f n norm square times f n of x. Okay. Now this one will be exactly f f of n f n of x. If f is orthonormal, not only orthogonal but also size one, everything, then it will be just this, all right? Because this will be one. Uh, we call this as general Fourier series. This is general Fourier series. Now, you might wonder what in the world suddenly this is called Fourier series, right? We don't see any sign, cosine, whatever. Well, we'll come back to that shortly. And theorem B. If this one F1, F2, and B is a R, so called, is a complete orthogonal set. I'm just going to with respect to R of X. Now, complete means that this is a basis. Everything <coughs> in 